The Other Side of Fear, A Backpacker's Memoir by Jenny Rivas. Unhidden Heroine, Series, Book Number One. Chapter 24, The Sacred Temple. When I arrived at the bus terminal of Ipiales the next day, I immediately heard a driver calling out, Temple! Taxi to the Las Lajas Temple! The universe provided guideposts every step of the way. They had a place where I could store my bags right there in the bus terminal for a dollar, and then a taxi would take me to the sacred sanctuary for another dollar. No time to lose. Stuffed in a taxi bus with other travelers packed in like sardines, I sat gazing out the window, and the heat of the sun was making my new tattoo on my neck and arm tingle. The taxi parked at the opening of a paved road that disappeared around a bend. All I could see were people wandering around the bend in both directions. The excitement of the unknown pulled me onward, out of the taxi and onto the path by myself. Around the bend, the paved road continued into the distance, bursting with street vendors selling everything you can imagine. Handbags, woven blankets and quilts, keychains, pottery, clothing, embroidered sandals, and a medley of street fruit. I spent time checking out every little thing, step by step, until the path curved to the right, and there it was. I froze. My intuition had told me it would be magnificent, that this was even more astonishing than anything I could conjure with my human mind. It looked like a palace built for kings and queens right between mountain passes, bridging the canyon over the Huaritara River. The mystic power it held pulled me closer without my acknowledgement, leading my feet one in front of the other until I reached the bridge. According to Columbia's legends, the mystic power I felt also created miracles that occurred there dating back to the 1700s. Visiting the temple is viewed as a pilgrimage by those who believe in its magical power. I didn't know the details of the specific legends, nor did I feel a draw to dig into them. I knew it had its own kind of magic just for me. I was rendered speechless by the power, yet my feet carried me across the bridge while the river roared below. Tears flooded my cheeks, and more than anything, I was thankful that I had so that I was so treasured and loved that life itself would give me the opportunity to see something so exquisite in person with my own eyes. I could hear the gasps of others around me having their own holy experience, the river, and spiritual songs sung in different languages spoken around me. I saw a glimpse at how big God really is, that it isn't about a religion, but a spiritual experience. This moment was a spiritual experience that didn't divide people by doctrine and details, but instead transcended every man-made boundary. It transcended language barriers, skin color, and religious beliefs. I felt the divine force of holy love that beckoned me forward with tenderness, open arms, and divine feminine grace. It wanted to show me and give me something. After exploring both inside and outside the temple, I stood outside basking in the glory of how the turrets of this neo-Gothic Architecture elegantly contrasted the green foliage of the Colombian mountains. I want to be closer to the river, <clears throat> I heard from inside of me. I immediately saw the opening to a path leading me down to where I wanted to go. The river rushed through a canyon about 150 feet below, and in that moment, I had never been so grateful for a strong, healthy body, which could take me anywhere I wanted to go. I descended the steps, taking in the beauty around me from new angles. When I reached the bottom, I was rendered speechless again by the living beauty surrounding me and the roar of the rushing river. Hidden among the trees was a narrow dirt path that led me into the woods. Dreamily walking along the path, I found an opening to the river bank where I found a boulder and relaxed near the water. The immense, holy, pure love allowed me to access the truth held within my skin. I understood the toxicity of the adrenaline hangover left from the dangerous situation I had escaped the day before. The experience flooded me with rage, anxiety, powerlessness, victimization, shame, and awoke the maggot feeling I had felt on the inside at different times throughout my life. The incessant vibration of love emanating from the sacred land around me did something that drastically impacted my life from that moment forward and into forever. I longed to feel the water of the river. As I knelt by it, I saw a little girl crouched down on a rock, looking at me with a huge smile on her face. I blinked twice, thinking I was imagining things. I realized the only thing covering her skin was a handmade skirt and baubles adorning her wrists. Her hair was long and dark, cascading around her face, her skin a light brown color like coffee with a splash of milk. 
We remained still, looking at each other from afar. I called out to her, and she shook her head. She pointed to the water, and my instincts told me she wanted me to look there. I studied my reflection in the crystalline water. My short hair, barely long enough to clip back on the sides, guided my thoughts to the femininity I had hidden for years because it made me feel weak and vulnerable. I let the feeling of pure love flow all over me and welcomed it to come inside. I closed my eyes and splashed my face and hair with the cold water from that river. I want you to hate me forever were Oscar's final words to me and they had been in the soundtrack of my mind for more than 10 years. My hate for him expired years ago, but had converted into hate for myself, rather. I carried the hate and disgust for so long it seemed normal. The previous day's incident conjured flashbacks, flashbacks from the rape when I was 20. I let them come forward, and I intentionally thought of them as I cleansed my head with that river water. When I looked up, the girl was gone. After that day, I never felt maggots on the inside of me ever again. The path led me right to that perfect symbolic ending to a chapter and to a cycle of destruction in my life. From the Ipiala's bus terminal, a taxi shepherded passengers to the border for a couple of bucks. The border was a madhouse with a long line for the exit stamp to leave Colombia and another long line for entry into Ecuador. Welcome to Ecuador, read an imposing blue sign hoisted above several lanes of car traffic, waiting for inspection by immigration officials. Again. I felt fireworks exploding within me. When I first arrived in Colombia back in June, I had no idea I would cross the border into Ecuador. What other borders would I cross? Rugged backpackers who wandered alone on their journeys stood behind me in line with their worn, dirty packs on their backs. The man who happened to be standing in line in front of me was another angel in my path. He was not only a veteran of crossing borders by land, but as a team. We watched over each other's things during runs to public restrooms. After five hours of waiting in lines, I finally made it across the border, and I paid another dollar for a cab to take me to Tucan, the first glimpse of a town in Ex and my first glimpse of a town in Ecuador. This was the closest border town with a bus station where I could get a ticket to Ecuador's capital, Quito. I hadn't given any thought to where in Ecuador I would go. I just showed up. I got there in the nick of time to catch the last seat on the last bus to Quito where I arrived at 11 p.m. and found a room in a rundown hotel a few blocks from the bus terminal. My final semester at OU started in a week and I would have no more paychecks from the university. My next income bump would come with the arrival of my tax return sometime in February. For both of these reasons, I knew I needed to remain in one economical place for the duration of my 90-day visa. After spending a couple of days in Quito, <clears throat> I chose to visit the coast before making my decision about where to set down temporary routes. During the last few months, I gained access to the webpage workaway.com, where travelers can find opportunities to exchange volunteer hours for a place to stay. Once I decided to leave Quito, I logged onto the website and connected with a lady who needed help building her bamboo house. She was delighted to receive me, so off I went with my few possessions on my back once again bus hopping to join her. I took a five hour bus from Quito to Esmeraldas and from there caught a little micro bus of 10 people which carried me three hours north on a primitive hidden path decked with jungle flora I had never ever seen before. For three sun-filled days I stayed at her partially constructed bamboo house. I learned how to build a roof with branches of trees and apply a special wood treatment to the bigger pieces of bamboo used for pillars. I met a Mexican girl named Rita while staying there. She was a professional surfer, fulfilling her lifelong dream of traveling the coast of South America, surfing every tide in every country that she possibly could. At night, I slept in a hammock with a mosquito net around me because the jungle-esque coastline of Ecuador had the biggest mosquitoes I had ever seen. There must have been a hole in my mosquito net somewhere because I was awake all night scratching and the next day I had huge red welts all over my arms and my legs. I followed Rita as she headed out surfing with her buddies one day. The beaches were sparsely populated with people, which was a far cry from my experience on the coast of Colombia in Santa Marta. There were locals fishing and the three of us looked for the right place for my two house buddies to hop on some waves. Before long, I met an Argentinian who owned a local surf shop. He invited me to go with him to Playa Negra, Black Beach, where the, oceans, where the beaches were covered with dark gray sand and lined with coconut trees. 
rugged jungle plants, and a handful of local fishermen. The dark beach starkly contrasted clear blue-green ocean waves washing up on the shore. The locals explained to me that the sand was so dark because of its rich composition of metals, uranium, copper, and titanium. At one point, the beach was getting torn up by miners looking for minerals, but the local people protested. In 2017, a petition with more than 5,000 signatures demanded that the beach be left alone. There I was, standing on it with my bare feet. It was so beautiful, it looked like a picture off a calendar. A group of strangers arrived on the beach, and while chatting, I learned they were on vacation from Uruguay. I played soccer barefoot on the beach for the first time in my life with their kids. Every second was an incredible experience, until the adults opened a cooler of cold beer and popped out an eight ball of Coke to start the party. I knew I was too fragile to stay, so I came up with a story to leave immediately. The realization that I couldn't ever hide completely from Coke or any drug or alcohol struck me, but I still couldn't be around it. I decided that Monpiche was not the right place to stay long term, so I took a couple of days to explore the area my own way not knowing if I would ever see the coast of Ecuador again. I needed the stability of a bigger city like Quito while I focused on my academic endeavors. Before leaving Quito the first time, I exchanged numbers with a new friend who worked the front desk of the hotel where I stayed. He told me that if I decided to come back to Quito, he would find a better place for me to stay long term. See, the universe had everything lined up for me, as always. By the time I got back, he had responded with an address to the new place and I was able to get a taxi directly there to meet the property manager who was expecting my visit. The boarding house had rooms full of occupied bunk beds, but the room on the top floor was vacant. It was meant for two or three people with two beds, a private bathroom, and a desk and chair in the corner. The whole floor, floor shared a kitchen at the end of the hallway. I was happy to pay an extra monthly expense to have the, the space for myself. I knew there was no way I could focus on my school stuff if I shared a space with a room full of people. The building was beautiful and clean, and the owner and his mother were so kind to me. At the end of the hallway hung a balcony with vibrant red and pink flowers growing up the wall and through the iron designs of the balcony architecture. I set out there to drink black coffee, and their bulldog joined me every morning to hump my leg like clockwork. I grew close with the Venezuelan people in my hostel who made traditional food to share with me. Their stories about what they suffered before fleeing their country in crisis and what they endured was humbling, and it continues to be among the most important knowledge I gained while traveling. Some of my new friends took me to the middle of the world, the literal equator itself. There is a telescope you can use to see the volcanoes which surround the city. I made a friend named Jenny who reminded me of myself when I was younger. She was in her early 20s, already an entrepreneur, running her very own restaurant, selling artisanal hamburgers and thick milkshakes. She used her fluency in three languages to engage with customers in English, Spanish, and French. I cherished the time I spent sitting in her shop listening to stories and writing. All day every day, I worked on my final research projects for OU. I had my final comprehension project that every student was required to complete before graduating from the program. Additionally, I had the research project that Dr. D created as a means for making up the internship that I had screwed up. Dr. D's project consisted of reading eight books of his choice and discussing the process of trauma recovery and resilience exhibited by the main characters. My own life trauma recovery and the concept of resilience itself, all while adding the academic resources to support my discussions. I pulled the trigger on finding an online TEFL certificate that I could work toward, hoping it would open doors for teaching jobs as I traveled. My job <clears throat> through the university was officially over. <clears throat> my next income bump was still a few weeks away, and it would have to last until I graduated in May when I could find a job teaching English. Twice a week, I walked into the restaurant down the road, sorry, twice a week, I walked to the restaurant down the road where they sold homemade lunches for $1.50. Each lunch included soup of the day and an enormous bowl, plus the main plate with the meat of my choice, salad and rice, chopped off with a bottomless glass of fresh juice. Other times, 
I took my laptop and journal to the Juan Valdez a few blocks away in Plaza Foch, where I bought a large house coffee for less than a dollar. It included free refills served by the handsome clerk behind the counter, who was tickled pink to practice English with me. I sat there for hours, reading and writing and people watching. I didn't know it then, but that's when I really started writing this book. When I needed a break, I snagged a last minute getaway to Baños, a small nature town located in a valley surrounded by mountains. It was only about four hours south of Quito by bus, and I had heard great things about it. I wasn't sure how long I would be in Ecuador or if I would ever come back. I remember leaving behind my books, my laptop, and everything I had been focused on, cutting loose and having fun on the, for those four days. At my hostel, I met a French girl named Manon, who lived in Spain for years with her grandma and preferred not to be associated at all with her French culture. Manon, another lady from Italy who we'd befriended at our hostel named Fiamme, and I decided to go whitewater rafting together. Manon and I had similar spirits, traveling alone and free on an open road with no plans. But this was Fiamme's first trip alone. In fact, she hadn't traveled at all for years. The next day, Fiamme and I caught a bus to a nature park right outside of town where she'd heard there was a waterfall worth seeing. While hiking through the forest to find the entrance to the waterfall, I ran into an American guy named Ezra who tagged along. I learned that he had been traveling alone for more than three years and experienced more than 60 countries. Hearing his story was a pivotal part of my journey at that point because it was the first time I had met someone doing that, and it was also what I wanted to do. I couldn't have braved the waterfall path without both of them. There was a narrow tunnel we had to crawl through to get to the path up behind the waterfall. I suffered from claustrophobia for years after my kidnapping when I was 20. So wiggling my way through a rock tunnel on my stomach was something that took a tremendous amount of courage for me. Ezra and Fiamma talked me through it, especially the moments where I froze, convinced that I could not keep going. I am so glad I faced that fear though, because once I got to the other side, I was able to stand behind the waterfall and look at the rainbow laced view of the gorge that parted the mountains as far as my eyes could see. Everything you want is on the other side of fear.